All right, please open your Bibles. Number two. Please open your Bibles to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, that's where... That's uh, it's a, kind of an end-of-the-year message, I suppose. We'll have a beginning-of-the-year message on Wednesday evening. But uh, this is just... Uh, we're Sunday evenings, we're a little bit in transition, not in the middle of a series, and kind of waiting until the beginning of the year to begin a series on Sunday uh, morning and evening and Wednesday evening. And so uh, this, is, this is a message that has to do with our uh, theme for next year. The theme for next year is going to be rejoicing with great joy. So that'll be our church theme. And I think that just a little bit of the time that believers don't do the things that cause us to be obedient to the commandment to rejoice in the Lord all way. And we'll see one of those themes this evening about joy in uh, Psalm 126. But as well, uh, sometimes I think when you've been saved a while, you forget that a lot of the messages and a lot of the scriptures that many believers have memorized and are very familiar with sometimes are less familiar uh, to the new generation of believers, the new Christians. And this really is a passage of Scripture, the mindset behind which ought to shape the way that we think uh, as far as the attitude that we have toward, I believe, reaching the lost. And so let's go to Psalm chapter 126, and we'll read all six verses. We'll pray for the Lord's help after that. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion... We were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Father, I pray that you would give us simple understanding and as well uh, practical application for the Scripture tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I am not this evening equating a passage of Scripture about the captivity of Zion or the turning of the captivity of of Zion uh, to something that is specifically about the church. However, there are prophetic things, uh, there are prophetic elements in Psalm 126. And there are truths about God and about our response to captivity uh, toward God uh, that are true uh, in all ages and in all e events. Certainly, David would not have been part of the Babylonian captivity, and certainly the psalmist that actually penned Psalm 126 uh, would not have been part of, say, the Babylonian captivity. So we're talking about, uh, practically speaking in context, we're speaking of uh, being freed from bondage among enemies. If you read through the judges, for instance, what are the judges about? Well, they're about deliverance, aren't they? The salvation and the deliverance of Israel. So we would know that the context of here, of course, Zion being that spiritual city, uh, that, that spiritual Jerusalem, uh, we would know the context would be uh, being free from the enemies of God's people or free from bondage. And the reality of it is that every person who's lost can 100% absolutely relate to captivity. I can't... Um, I can't describe captivity more than I've, I've used this illustration a few times in a different context, but I can't describe captivity more than a couple of years ago. I remember seeing a man in Taco Bell with a heavy log chain around his neck and a padlock on it. And he was obviously, he was in the Wilton Manors area, he was obviously in the homosexual lifestyle and being very ostentatious about it. And you know, as I looked at that individual, he was being kind of very, you know, he, we were, it was a Sunday afternoon, a lot of us church folks were there, and he was being very um, blatantly uh, about his lifestyle, kind of in your face about it, in, in an offensive way, sort of. And so, 
you know, I wanted to say something, or I wanted to just leave, really, to be quite honest with you. And I remember that the Scripture says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. That does not mean we go and, and uh, destroy the wicked. That's God's got that handled quite well. But really, what the man's chain around his neck represented is captivity. And so, I was getting a drink, and he came up next to me to get his drink, kind of getting in my personal space a little bit too much. In a way, it was uncomfortable. And I turned to him, and I said, you know, I don't know if anyone's told you this today, but I want you to know that God loves you very much, and Jesus loves you. And you know, that's what a person in captivity needs to hear. That's the message for a person in captivity. And you know, the Scripture is true. The wicked do flee when no man pursueth. It's amazing when you preach the gospel. You want to know what the response to blatant, in-your-face wickedness is? The proclamation of the gospel. And not a fake, uh, you know, I hate you kind of a gospel, but a Jesus loves you gospel. And God can save you and God can deliver you from captivity. You know, that's the deal with anyone who's in sin or anyone who's lost, actually. You ever wonder why people behave the way they do? I mean, they're just terrible behavior sometimes, isn't there? You know, when that lost person behaves in an obnoxious, uh, wicked, just a difficult to get along, hateful way, you know what the issue is? Captivity. You know, when a believer, when a believer behaves in an unloving, obnoxious, hateful way, you know what the issue is? Captivity. In both cases, it's sin. And any person who's living in sin is in bondage or in captivity. And so we could, we're not spiritualizing this evening to say that though a person may not be nationally, let us, as a nation, we may be free people. Though a person may be part of a free people or a free nation, he can just as easily uh, be in captivity. And so that's what we see here in Psalm 126. We see literally captivity. We see uh, that when they were delivered that it was like um, we were like them that dream now notice this when the lord capital l o r d jehovah god when he turned again the captivity of zion the scripture says we were like them that dream have you ever actually tasted and seen that the lord is good remember the remember when you first realized forgiveness when you actually not only believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you actually realized forgiveness, reconciliation. Like, I should be God's enemy. I deserve death, eternal death and hell. But God's not my enemy. He's my Father and I have fellowship with Him and there is nothing between me and Him. And He's still a perfect God. But he is reconciled. Do you ever just remember? You ever just remember when you just you had that load of sin? When John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he used the illustration of Christian with a heavy burden on him. And when he came to the wicked gate, it's supposed to be when he comes to the cross. When he came to the cross, the burden fell off, and he was able to stand up straight, and he was able to walk freely without a burden on him. Remember the first time you the burden was gone. You didn't have to wonder what's going to happen to me, what's my future, uh, what will happen when I die. You just realize everything is all right. Everything's okay. It's almost hard to believe, wasn't it? You ever just looked at your life from an eternal perspective and asked the simple question, what do I have need of on the basis in, with the consideration that Jesus Christ is all I need? And you just ask that question, say, you know, what's wrong in my life? And you realize... Everything is fine. Anything that is a problem in my life is temporary. The, all the eternal problems are settled once and for all forever. And it really just, just I, you seem like one that dreams, don't you? I mean, sometimes we're so part of this world that heaven seems distant. But you get in fellowship with God and you, uh, you meditate on spiritual things and the reality of eternity becomes very, very real. And at that point, you almost seem like, is this, can it be like this? I, I was thinking about this last week. What is going to be like? What is going to be like to be in the presence of God? Anthony was asking me questions this week about what's it going to be like to be, you know, are you going to see God? Are you going to, you know, just be in God's presence? 
And it's going to be a busy place around there. I'm, there's not going to be a lot of room for me for a few thousand years probably. I'll probably be pretty far back on the list. But the reality of it is that the very notion of an individual like me coming into God's presence it seems like a dream, doesn't it? It just seems like, like that, that oughtn't to be so. And that's the reality for a believer in Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And so I can relate to what the psalmist says when he said, when you know, the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. And then the response, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Let's stop first of all at the second part of verse 2, Psalm 126. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. It is right for individuals who are delivered to be filled with laughter. I do not mean like Solomon said when he said, I've said of mirth, it is mad. But literally a person who is not overburdened by sorrow, whose first response to anything in life is laughter. Literally, you're able to laugh. You ever gone through a season with no laughter? A season of no laughter? And when you come through it and you come to that place where you're able to not forced, but naturally just to laugh. You ever gone through a season when there wasn't a song? Amen. A season of no song? I love a song that's been written not very long ago, but God wants to hear you sing. I like the words and the theme of it. It just it kind of resonates. And, and uh, you know, one of the natural things for a believer ought to be a song. Amen. Song in our heart. You ever gone through a season with no song? And I'll tell you, when you come through that season, that season is captivity sometimes. So you come through that season and you're able to have a laughter. Not a forced, not a fake, not a wrong kind, but just a genuine laughter and a song in your heart. All of a sudden, things are different now, aren't they? Laughter. Song. And then the, the natural response is what the heathen see when they see you. The Bible says, Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. Let's stop here just a minute and let's talk about the importance of the testimony of the believer. I am not one who believes in the sufficiency of lifestyle evangelism. That is the person who pretends to be happy all the time so that people, uh, so that you don't have to share the gospel with people, it just, you know, they can just guess that the reason you're happy is because of what the Lord's done for you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You need to say what God has done, you know, and you need to testify uh, who the Lord is. And as believers, we're called to preach the gospel. But friend, when you have laughter and when you have singing and when you have triumph in your life, that is, you've been delivered from captivity, you have something that a lost person does not. And all they can say is the Lord delivered them. Listen to me just for a minute, would you please? I don't know how many families that are represented in this church began to be followers of the Lord Jesus or the family as a whole became believers after someone in the family was born again. In our family, my father got saved. And when my dad got saved, I'll tell you what happened to him. People said, you know, something happened to him. When he was born again, he was a different person. And when he was a different person, people said, you know, I don't know about that whole religion thing, but I'll tell you what happened to John Price. Something happened to him. It's real. And that's true of a lot of us here, isn't it? When so-and-so got saved, the family, people said, well, you know, I don't know about all that, but I'll tell you, that they're not, they're not fake. It's real. And when God turned the captivity of Zion and there became, uh, uh, they came from captivity to freedom and there, became la uh, there, there was laughter and there was a song on their tongue and they were rejoicing, then the heathen said, God's delivered them. God's delivered them. By the way, believer, then it is important, isn't it, to live in victory, to walk in victory. Because the converse is also true. How many times I've heard people say, well, you know what, if he's a believer, then how come? Then why? Well, you don't, you don't judge God on the basis of what a person does. God's who He is whether or not we're faithful. But friend, when you've been delivered from captivity and you're testifying of it, it it's just one of those things that cannot be denied. Did you know <laughs> Did you know that no person gets saved? Listen to me. You can take this out of context if you like. I don't even mind. 
You know, I don't think anyone gets saved because someone does such a convincing job of, of convincing them of who God is and that the gospel's true and so forth. That's right. I don't think anybody gets saved because, you know, they just logically have no choice about it. I think people get saved because the fact of the matter is, is that God's real, and when you experience Him, there's just, you know, the facts support it, but faith begins it all. I mean, you just, just, wow, you know, that's real. Now, we know what the Bible says about the reality that God has placed in us and knowledge of Him, that He's given us things that are undeniable proofs of His creation, and so there's no excuse for people that don't believe. But I don't think really anyone's ever convinced by an infallible argument to trust Jesus. Well, most people are convinced by a simple testimony. Simple testimony. I know a lot of people that, that have said that, you know, as when they be, begin to be burdened about soul winning and try to do soul winning, they used to try to match their soul winning to the intellect of the person that they were sharing the gospel with. And they would oftentimes try to match it to the degree of education of the person. I don't know how many people have told me I couldn't share the gospel with them. You know, they're a, you know, whatever their title is. They're this. I couldn't share the gospel with them. Well, you know what that person is? They're the same kind of they're they're a person who got educated. And an educated person is a person with an education. There's nothing in the Bible that says that the gospel is different for an education educated person or that an educated person can't have faith. See, every person that comes to God comes by faith. And so, you know, I, I remember, you know, thinking, you know, that guy's really smart. I'm gonna have to come up with a really, really good presentation of the gospel that, you know, appeals to his intellect. Or share the gospel. And you know what I found out? <laughs> you don't need to do that at all. You just preach the gospel. Just preach it as, as, as it is. Preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the truth of it, my friend. It, it's true. It doesn't need to be, you know, juiced up or dumbed down. It just needs to be preached. And uh, a person who preaches something that is true in his life is a person who has credibility to where the heathen would say, well, the Lord's delivered them. Uh, Dr. Tom Malone, who's now with the Lord in heaven, wrote a book on soul winning, and he gave an example in it about a man in his church back in, I believe it was the 1970s, uh, that would just every week was bringing people, was bringing people forward uh, for a public confession of their faith and to get baptized in church. And he said, the guy that was bringing people forward, he just said, you know, I just... I was really surprised that he could win anybody. He just wasn't a real bright guy. And he said he wore a ball cap and, you know, kind of old clothes. But every week he was bringing people down the aisle. And so he asked him one time, he says, how do you, how do you, what are you doing? And he said, well, I just, he couldn't read. So he'd just take a gospel presentation. He said, I just go to their house. I say, read this. You believe that? And people would say, well, yeah, I do. And he'd say, well, why don't you pray and ask Jesus to save you? And they would. And they say, "Well, now we need to go to church." And he was he was leading all kinds of intellects down the aisle. The fact of the matter is that the testimony of a believer is far more powerful, far more important than the intellect of a believer. <laughs> isn't it true? It's a fact, isn't it? And so uh, this is something that we need to be mindful of. We need to remember. Then it's repeated again in verse three: "The Lord hath done great things for us." Whereof we are glad. Friend, I just want to be around some glad people, don't you? I want to be around some glad believers. Don't be a glum believer. Don't be an unhappy believer. And I'm not telling you to pretend or act like something. I'm telling you just to get your, get your attitude to match what you are in Jesus Christ. If you're unhappy, if you're disgruntled, if you are ungrateful, those are attitudes that don't match a person who has been delivered from captivity. <laughs> Some years ago, I was helping Brother Dan Marino. Uh, we were we were uh, we were transporting some cars. We were taking his truck back over to his yard, which is not not the quarterback Dan Marino, the real Dan Marino. Okay, uh, everybody goes and starts. Uh, anyway, I was helping him uh, take some deliver some some. Uh, I can tell you a lot of Dan Marino stories because of that. But uh, we were taking some. We were parking his truck after we transported some cars. And where his truck is parked is right downtown from what they call Conti, the, the jail in Pompano. Yeah. And these guys were, just had backpacks, and I mean, they were just trucking it down the road with big old smiles on their faces. 
And you know what we knew about them? They just got out of jail. <laughs> you know? I mean, they were, they were, they had glad faces. They had, you know, they had backpacks in their hands and they were running down the road. You know, I don't think they knew where they were going, but they were headed there. And they were going fast and they had big old grins on their face. And I remember Danny and I driving by going, those guys just got out of jail. And they were happy about it. Well, maybe some of y'all need to go to jail and get released, you know, just to be able to realize what it is to be delivered from captivity. Listen, uh, you're free. You're no longer dead in your trespasses and sins if you have Jesus Christ for your Savior. And so you can rejoice about it. You can be glad about it. So I can't think of anything to be happy about. Really? That will put you in jail for a week or something. I can still see these guys uh, in my mind. Some things, I have a horrid memory, but there are some things that burn themselves like a video in my mind. I can see them running down the road just as happy as they could be, going to nowhere. I mean, they don't even know where they're at. They didn't, they didn't t walk to jail. They got brought there. and probably had no idea where they are when they got out. But they were happy about it because they were free. If you've ever been in something and gotten out of it, like you have for sin, gladness is the natural response. And if gladness isn't what you're experiencing or what you're evidencing in your life, there's something you've forgotten about. Or there's something that you are not realizing that Jesus Christ has already purchased for you that's your right to have, and that's freedom and victory in Jesus Christ. Gladness. Gladness. And uh, I like being around glad people. Now, I know some folks just enjoy being a grouch. I've met some folks that... I've had those days. I, I hate to admit it, but I've had days where I've gotten up and been, you know, just like, everybody, get out of my way, and I kind of like the response I get. You know, when you're just like, don't say a word to me or I'll bite your head off kind of a day. Some folks enjoy that space they get or the power they feel, I guess, when they're grumpy. But let me just warn you, people don't like you for very long if that's the way you always are. And, you know, it's just great to be around glad people, isn't it? You don't have to worry about, you know, they're going to get upset about something. or maybe They're glad. Gladness. And uh, that's the response of a delivered people. The Lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad. Now that seems like a no-brainer, common-sense statement, doesn't it? God's done great things for us, whereof we are glad. We're glad for the great things God has done. Uh, I told you the message this evening isn't deep, it's just practical. Verse 4, Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. And then we come to a uh, two verses, and I want to ask you some questions to, to just help with the thinking. Um, verse 5 and 6, now, there are ministries, for instance, like Bearing Precious Seed Ministries. Most folks are familiar with them. They uh, print Bibles and they print Scriptures. and They've reached a lot of folks in a lot of places. And it's a gospel tract and Scripture ministry. But this is the passage of Scripture uh, where they get their theme or their name from. He that, they that sow in tears, the Bible says, shall reap in joy. Now, we understand, don't we, the, the analogy or the illustration. Sowing in tears reaping in joy. Practically speaking, let me just ask you the question. How many farmers cry during planting season? A lot. Anybody that knows farmers know they cry about everything, right? I mean, <laughs> a farmer can get his welfare check and cry about it. We joke about welfare check, government subsidies and so forth. My dad had a friend who was a farmer and shared his crops every year and had massive farms and he prayed for his crops to be destroyed. And he made out like a bandit every year, and he would just come in sobbing about how terrible things were. And, and you know, he's a millionaire. You know, and just, it's, oh, it's just farming so hard, it's so terrible, it's so la da da da. You know, and it's true that, but the fact of the matter is that realistically, there's nothing about sowing seed to make a person cry unless it's the very agony of the labor. Unless it's the agony of the labor. I, I can't think of many times seeing people work themselves to tears. Can you? Now, I, I remember in high school football practices where people were crying while they were in, you know, the agony of the labor. It was sort of the pain of it too, you know, just a little bit mixed. I've seen people working through things and crying. Let me ask you a question. What in the world is the Scripture alluding to here when it talks about sowing in tears? It makes a person cry as they sow, as they plant. You've invested everything in it. Okay, the investment. 
Right? You plant your last grain, your last seed. What do you have after that? Okay. Pleasure. What's that? Pleasure. Pleasure. They cry from pleasure. Tashi's a weird guy, man. <laughs> Hit me, man. I love crying. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. I don't know about you. <laughs> You never want to mess with a guy that thinks like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what's the scripture talking about? Well, I think it's correctly applied, don't you? When we talk about sowing more than just seeds of grain. Could we agree this evening that the scripture here is not talking about the farmer's annual planting? Yeah, it's the people. I think I think that what we're sowing is has to do with people. And friend, the reality of what's that? Yeah, I was gonna say I think the reference to so many tears is that you gotta go through a lot of people, a lot of injections and all that stuff, so all that passion. Okay, so so say say you're sharing the seed, you're planting the seed, the seeds the gospel with people and you're rejected. Does it hurt to be rejected? Am I the only person in the world that has feelings? <laughs> right? Pastor, you don't have feelings. No, I've got lots of them. I wear them on my shirt sleeve. And I wipe my nose on them all the time. All right. uh, you know, it, it, does it feel good to be rejected? No, so it could be talking about rejection. But you know what? You know what a person that really weeps over something weeps over? Something that's lost. Something that's lost. Jesus gave the parable of the lost sheep. Do you remember that? And you know that, that picture of leaving the 90 and 9 and going and finding the one sheep. There's an agony in that. There is a love or a burden, an investment in that. I don't know of a better illustration. I don't think a person has taken it from context at all to say that the illustration here fits the gospel better than anything else. It fits better than anything when Jesus saw the multitudes and He looked on them. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion because they were a sheep without a shepherd and they fainted. I believe compassion leads to weeping. Compassion leads to weeping. If you ever come to a place of empathy or sympathy, you're very close to the place of weeping for someone. You know, the first question we ought to ask when somebody does something that upsets us is why in the world did they do that? And you know, as soon as you figure out the answer, all of a sudden you'll have compassion. It's incredible the things that people do that we consider to be obnoxious, unforgivable, unconscionable, and when we actually look at it from their side, which ultimately oftentimes is they are as lost as they can be, then all of a sudden we come to a place where we say, you know what, compassion. And all of a sudden, instead of being angry with them, we weep for them. All of a sudden, instead of responding to them, we sow in them. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, the Scripture says, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You want to change something? You want to change somebody? Well, man, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And it doesn't really change anybody, does it? How about sowing a seed in them? How about withholding the peace of your mind and instead come to a place of weeping for them? The most angry, the most obnoxious people in the world when you find out what's going on in the background, I'll tell you what, I just can't hardly hold it against anybody. I've read, I've read um, biographies about people and I've, read, uh, I've watched documentaries about some of the worst people on earth. People have done terrible things. You know what's always the most gut-wrenching about them is not what they've done, but usually what they've been through before they've done what they've done. Everybody's got a story. Everybody has a background. You know the story of every person without Jesus Christ is that they're lost? They're lost. And an individual who goes forth and weeps, literally realizing this person is lost, Ever, has loss ever bothered you? There are people in the 1920s that jumped out of windows because they lost this. What is it when we lose a soul? What is it when a soul of a man is lost? What's the value of a soul? The, the Scripture asks the practical question, 
what would a man give in exchange for his soul? What's the price of his soul? What's the value of his soul? Well then, what? how great is the loss when a soul is separated from God? How great is the loss? What's the value of it? You ever been upset over something? And, I mean, something, some major loss and it really upsets you? A major loss? I have been. Sometimes I've lost things I thought, you know, I ought to be more upset than I am. Right? So that's a big loss. You know? But the reality of it is that there's no loss which compares with a soul's being lost. The soul of a man. You ever asked the other question that relates to it? What's the value of the life of Jesus Christ? You ever asked that question? You know, many people struggle with worth, self-worth. And the answer to that is not to believe in yourself. I've told people all the time, you try and believe in yourself, you ain't got much hope. To be honest with you. you know, just, just be you, just believe in you. Just be yourself and believe in yourself. And I think, man, if I were to do that, I wouldn't have much to go on. But what's the value of Jesus? God's perfect, sinless Son, who in every way pleased the Father. What's the value of a drop of His blood that was shed on the cross? For our sins. What would you pay for it? For its cleansing power. For its covering power. What's the, what's the value of the blood of Jesus Christ? Could you imagine offering God something for it? Thank you for thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Here's fifty bucks. Blasphemous, isn't it? Well, it's because the amount's so low. Here's a million dollars. I'll do something nice for you one day. You just can't put a price on it. You just... For, the, for God to love us when we're His enemies and then to sacrifice the Son that He loved who in every way pleased the Father, you just can't put a dollar amount or an act of devotion that measures up to that. There's nothing like it. He that goeth forth in weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Then the Bible says, bringing his sheaves with him. This coming up here, one of the things we want to do is not only preach the gospel, we want to be effective in preaching the gospel. There's an attitude I believe that is a prerequisite to being effective preaching the gospel. It's an attitude of victory. A believer who is in captivity cannot be effective in preaching the gospel. But a believer who is in victory will be an individual who is glad, who has a song coming from his mouth, or a song on his, uh, uh, sorry, laughter in his mouth and a song on his tongue has gladness and those individuals that don't know the Lord will say the Lord delivered him. And all that person has to say is and he can do it for you. And then when he sees someone in captivity to be able to weep for them will ultimately culminate in being able to Rejoice with them. Friend, I have to say that all of the things that all of the matters that I can bring to my recollection about lost people that I've agonized over have ended up exactly like the scripture says. You got a lost loved one? Near to you, dear to you? You have a lost neighbor or family friend? Well, it's important, first of all, for you to be delivered from captivity. You know what else is important? For you to evidence deliverance. And then to weep over them. While you're glad for yourself to realize their bondage. So precious seeds, the gospel. And the Bible says, you do that, 
the result is that you're going to come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You say, Pastor, you know, that's an agricultural, it's an agricultural um, illustration. Yeah, it's an illustration, but don't you think there's a spiritual truth behind it? Of course, is, is God trying to teach us about the happy farmer who starts out the crying farmer and then becomes a happy farmer? Harvest time's a good time, but you usually find a worm in whatever you harvest in. <laughs> now, the reality of it is, is that there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? And the Gospel helps us to understand what it's about. It's about the value of the souls of men. How about it, Christian? How about, how about 2019? How about it? I think it should be a good, good passage of Scripture for all of us to have memorized and to be thinking about the importance of victory, the importance of having a song in our heart, and the importance of sowing seeds with weeping so that by the end of the year, man, we'll be ending it with a harvest. Father, thank You for, for the just the opportunity and the outlook. Again, thank You for this passage of Scripture, commonly known by many. God is so valuable, so important in our way of thinking, and I pray that You would help us to adopt the mindset of the psalmist as we preach the Gospel in 2019. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your good attention this evening. You're dismissed.